Kevin here at Skylab bringing another video. This is definitely going to be a fun one. We haven't talked very much about amplifiers, and it just so happened that we have four or five of them around the shop that we think you would want to see. There's a couple of them that it might be a while for us to get another one in, and so we thought we'd make this video now. It wasn't necessarily even a planned video. It just just happened to be looking around the shop and went, oh wow, okay, um, we need to make a video about these while we still got them. Also, after we go over these amplifiers, if you are interested in adding an amplifier to your current system, maybe you've got a small wattage receiver or integrated amplifier, we're going to go over how that's done because we do seem to be getting customers in at least once a week that are trying to do this and they don't understand how. So after we go over these amplifiers, we're going to hook up a small receiver or integrated amplifier to show you how you would do that. It's going to be a fun video. We've got a lot of good eye candy to show you. Eric's in a great mood. I'm in a great mood. We want to talk about amplifiers. Let's get into it. Let's do it. Let's do it. And the first big amplifier we've got up on the bench is going to be the Pioneer Spec 4 stereo power amplifier made between 1977 and 1980. The MSRP was $700. You've got 150 watts and 8 ohms. This is a dual mono construction with analog watt meters. And if you were looking for the matching or the companion preamp, you'd be looking for a Spec 1. This is definitely one that I would consider to be kind of a holy grail for the Pioneer fans out there. You want to see what it looks like all over? Yes. Yeah. Line it up. Money shot. There you go. Look at those meters. Big watt meters. And on the inside, as you can see, and I think most of the amplifiers are going to be this way that we show you. This is a dual mono construction. So you've got um, two transformers. You've got individual amp boards and two relays actually there's four relays on this model these are about as cool as they get as far as the looks go and the performance goes i mean these things are just tanks built really well they sound great um rack mountable and even back in 1978 they actually sold a pioneer rack that you could buy that was badge pioneer I've actually only seen one of those in person. Uh, a few years ago, a guy brought in his rack that he bought brand new. Uh, he had the EQ, he had the Spec 1, he had the Spec 2 amplifier, which is the lower wattage version of the Spec 4. And he had a 570, PL570 turntable. It was a really impressive looking system, and he bought it brand new uh, in the late 70s. So. He, did you buy it from him? No, he. Um, we just serviced a few of the pieces for him and made sure everything was working. But, so there definitely were speakers back then that did require this type of amplification. This would get the job done. I think it's definitely one of the cooler looking amplifiers from the 70s. And as far as serviceability goes, I mean, these are really straightforward. Filter caps are easy to get to. That is the nice thing about amplifiers. They're really just not very overcomplicated. If you can get good access to all the boards, um, that's usually a win. These can be a little bit tricky because the wire wrapped cables coming from the output transistors, it makes a little bit of a challenge. Nothing too bad. What you do is you remove the whole heat sink with the amplifier on it and um, that's the best way to be able to service it. So if you're looking for a monster pioneer amplifier from the 70s, Definitely can't go wrong with a Spec 4 or Spec 2. Oh, hey, we've got new hats in. They're pretty much the same design as the last hat. They're just not fitted anymore. We've got the snapback hat, so one size fits off. You've got a massive cranium or a, a small melon. Uh, this one hat is a Richardson 112. Should have you covered. Love it. Love it. It's my favorite sure. hat. All right, next up on the bench, we've got the Phase Linear 700B and the Phase Linear 400 Series 2. Both of these have really large meters. Obviously, my preference would be the analog view meters on the 700B. And the 700B came out in the mid-70s, and it had an MSRP of $879. 
345 watts per channel into 8 ohms. These are a very, very rare amplifier. I, this is the only one I've had in the 8 years that I've been open. And it's a little brother over there, the 400 Series 2, came out in 1978. It's got the LED output meters on it, and the MSRP was around $700. Both of these pieces were definitely on the expensive side, um, but you know, I don't think there were a lot of amps that were putting out 350 watts per channel back then. This thing is kind of a rarity. And for those of you that are familiar with Bob Carver or Carver Electronics, Phase Linear is essentially Bob Carver's design. These are really well made. The Phase Linear amps from this era did have a couple issues, which gave them the nickname Flame Linear, in that they didn't have speaker protection on them. You hear a lot of people kind of dog on these amplifiers and call them flame linear. Usually when we get these before we sell them, we do the speaker protection relay just to make sure that doesn't happen and makes them safe to operate. Is that easy to put in? Not bad. I'll pop off the top and um, we can take a look at it. And I'm pretty sure both of these have that relay done on them already. Looking at these amplifiers, you would assume they're really deep, you know, like the chassis went way back, and then you pull them out of a rack and you realize they're not all that big, they're not all that deep. Really, they're kind of lopsided when you carry them because that transformer is really heavy, and the rest of it, there's not much going on there. And as you can see on this one, there's actually been some pretty significant uh, modification and refurbishment done. You know, you got your new filter caps, you got these new replacement boards, these things get hot and it's really easy for a board to overheat and get hairline cracks in it or start to curve. I don't remember who makes these, but um, we've, we've bought several of them. You can see on this one as well, there's the new speaker protection relay there. Right here? Yeah, right there. That, that wasn't a part of the original design. And you can see kind of the original board compared to, you know, the new board. Who makes the new board? White Oak. And I think that's who makes the, um, the speaker protection relay. That one right there, that is, uh, that's a forever piece for somebody. These do look cool when they are moving. Um, when you have, a, when you have audio going through them, they kind of dance up and hit. Look kind of like Knight Rider. Yeah, kind of like Knight Rider. So definitely, if you're looking for a monster amplifier, um, I would be looking for a Phase Linear 700B. I think for the money, that's a great amplifier. I mean, the 400 is great too. Most people don't need over 200 watts per channel either. I mean, do they have a warm sound or a clinical sound? Or is there any sound signature that goes with these? Or is the difference between the ones that we're showing today? You know, the amplifiers, they don't have a lot of sound signatures. You know, I mean, some people out there might sound crazy, but you're going to get most of the difference in your preamp. You know, the, the preamp's going to color the sound more than anything. So it's really going to depend on what preamp you put in front of it. You know, if you put a tube preamp in front of it, it's going to sound like two. If you put a solid state preamp in front of it, it's going to sound like solid state. You know, I don't think you get as much of a, a variation with the sound of amplifiers as you do with the sound of preamplifiers. But again, that's just my opinion, and you'll hear a hundred other ways that people will say that I'm wrong. And that's just the way audio goes. So. And coming up next, we've got the Harman Kardon 16. And the Harman Kardon 16 came out in the mid-70s, and the MSRP is $599. They're 150 watts per channel into 8 ohms. Again, another dual mono construction. We've had quite a few of these. I love this amplifier. They're usually really reliable. I don't think we've ever had one come back that we've sold or we've serviced. And if you're looking for the preamp companion, you need to be looking for the Model 11 or the Model 17. We've had a lot of these over the years. This one, a friend of ours, two times Tony. Two and three fourths. Or two and three fourths Tony. I messaged him and said, hey, do you have one here? He's got like three of these things. He was nice enough to bring this one in so we could use it for the video because I didn't think there was really much of a point of doing a 70s solid state amplifier video not having the Harman Kardon 16. So thank you 
you, Tony. Appreciate it. What's your favorite thing about this camp? Um, I just fell upon this one with a uh, tuner and a matching, uh, matching preamp at a estate sale and for a ridiculous price and i got it and uh, i've not turned back since i i bought this one not, now i own three i've had hard drive speakers dahlquists uh, martin logan's maggie's you name it. it it makes every set of speakers i put on it even some panasonic thrusters uh sound good you know that's why we're a lot of us are into vintage we like the looks of them it's kind of like a little little business in the front the touch of party with the lights, the, all the parties in the back, you know, mm -hmm. and a mullet, so it kind of goes <laughs> along with that. And the meters on these are also LEDs. They've got several colors uh, going from green, yellow, to red. And let's see, do we have power in this guy? I'm not sure if this one even works. See, this might be maybe a dead unit or something, because there's one planning on refurbishing. Are those lamps hard to replace if one yeah, goes out they're kind, of, they're kind of a pain in the butt the problem is is you usually just can't replace one because it'll be a lot brighter than the others yeah so you have to almost relamp the whole thing but if you look on the inside of these two you know you've got or even on the back you know there's 20 transistors on this amplifier it's insane and again great build quality easy to work on everything easy to access everything get your four monster filter capacitors, two transformers, dual mono construction, really well-made stuff. Everything from Harman Kardon in the 70s was really well-designed, really easy to work on, really well-made. Made in the USA, Plainview, New York. I don't know why I always use Darth Vader as a reference for the way some pieces of equipment look, but this definitely could be in Vader's TIE Fighter. Did you have a tie yeah, he had a, yeah, a yeah. This looks like something R two D two would try to crack into to yeah. release. Uh, the prison cell day. Yeah. So definitely a really cool amplifier for sure. Several times when I bought these from somebody, they said that they bought Magnapan speakers. They didn't really have many options, you know. And at the price point, I think they were probably selling quite a few of these. I definitely had more Harman Kardon sixteen than any other solid state amplifier from the 70s. I think they sold a lot of these. I think there's a lot of them out there and I think they continue to work. Therefore, their numbers just remain high. I oh. definitely think they're undervalued. Um, when you see them online, you'll see these sell anywhere between like 600 to to $1,000. In my opinion, it's pretty cheap for what you're getting, the build quality and everything. All right, Macintosh. Macintosh. Is that the heaviest one? Not even by a little bit. We've got the Macintosh 2105, manufactured between 1967 and 1978, definitely the longest run of all the amplifiers we're talking about today. Uh, the 2105 is 105 watts per channel, and this is also Macintosh's first solid state amplifier. If you were wanting to grab the companion preamp, you'd be looking for either a C26 or a C28. And this is actually my amplifier. Um, we showed you in the last video, the Macintosh video, and I showed you the faceplate. This is the reason I ordered the faceplate. When I got this one, it was cracked. It does work, but this is actually on deck for Rob to go through, recap the power supply, all those kind of good things that, uh, that need to get done. It looks like maybe some coffee was spilled or something in here. I don't think that's uh, mouse urine. I know where I got this, and I just don't see that happening in that, that environment, but um, it looks more isolated to me. This is definitely an iconic amplifier. They're heavy. You got the big uh, meters up front. The only thing I don't like about these amplifiers are the speaker jacks. You've got the old spade style. Um, it'd be nice if these were, you know, banana jacks or something like that. But there's always ways to get around those types of things. If you're looking for 
you know, 100 watts per channel is a really good amplifier. You definitely can't go wrong with the 2105, there's no question. You know, with a 10 year, 12 year run like they had on this amplifier, I'm sure you could put that code into the search bank and figure out if this is one of the early ones or one of the later ones. Or maybe some of you out there can even tell just by the appearance of it. I don't know them that well in order to be able to date one just off the look. And one of the things that gives Macintosh kind of their signature sound is the autoformer. There's a really good article at rogerrussell.com uh, forward slash Macintosh where he kind of goes into it a little bit on why they used autoformers and kind of the, the sound signature that they were trying to achieve with them. But if there is a, a signature Macintosh amplifier sound, I think most people would agree those autoformers have quite a bit to do with this. And these, these do, I, I think these are a little bit mellow. I think they are a little bit tube-like sounding. And I genuinely try not to describe the sound of amplifiers uh, as much because, I, again, I don't think they have as much of a play in the overall experience as the preamps and the speakers do. But I, I kind of tend to agree with people that these are a little bit on the warm side for an amplifier. So take that for what it's worth. Yeah, mine has a. No, Eric has. Yeah, mine mine has kind of a just a warm, lovely sound. I I, just, I love the sound of it. It's it's. He's got the the small. Version. The slimline. Yeah, they're mono blocks. Yeah. Yeah. And they have they yeah they just as soon as I plugged them in for the first time and played a record I was just all smiles because it just I don't know if it reminded me of my parents' old console from when I grew up and it had that kind of soft sound that squishy kind of yeah warm sound which i i had no idea what that was as a kid but um hearing it when i got older it was like oh that's kind of a tube sound yeah that's what most people say you know when they talk about macintosh amplifiers is they do kind of have a tube characteristic to them and like we said at the beginning of the video we do get quite a few people come in and they say you know i want to keep my receiver but I want to add more power to it, and they don't know how to do that. You do have to have one feature in the receiver integrated amplifier in order to make this work. A lot of people think you can just put an amplifier on a receiver, and really that's like trying to add an engine to an engine. You can't do it. You need, you need pre-out and main ends in order to do it correctly. So I'm going to show you that here on this little Kenwood. When you're looking for a receiver, if you do think you're going to want to add an amplifier, that is something you definitely want to have. So you go out the preamp out, so it says pre out, and you go into the amplifier. You go pre out into the amplifier. And then you'll see a switch here that says normal or separate. Some amplifiers have that, some do not, but you want to make sure you put it to the separate position because that is going to separate your pre-amplifier from your internal amplifier. So in this case, you're using the Kenwood as a preamp only, you're bypassing the amplifier, you're sending the audio out of the preamp, and you're going into the amplifier, and then you're hooking your speakers up here. There's no need to hook your speakers up here because you're not using the amplifier. The nice thing is, is you'll still have full control of all of your input switches, volume, potentiometer, balance knob will all still work. This is all part of the preamp section. Now another way to do this, if you're wanting to use the amplifier from the Kenwood and you're wanting to use the amplifier from the Macintosh, is you could use Y cables. And essentially what you do at this point is, so you go out of the preamp with your Y cable, you bring one Y cable down to the amplifier. Here. And then you go back into the main end. And that means it's going back into the main amplifier. So at this point, we're going out of the preamp. We're going down to the Macintosh. And then we're also coming back into the amplifier of the Kenwood. And then you would just repeat this on the right channel as well. And then that way you could utilize the amplifier inside of the Kenwood as well as the Macintosh. You know, if you wanted to do a bi-amp situation on a set of speakers, or if you wanted to run more than two sets of eight-ohm speakers, that would be the way to do this. 
So for those of you out there looking to add an amplifier to a receiver, you know what? I was just going to say I wouldn't do this if you have a high-powered receiver, but that's not right either because, you know, how you enjoy your stereo equipment is up to you. It, it, it's kind of a waste. Let's say you're going to buy a Marantz 2270 and then you're not going to use the amplifier of the, the 2270 because you're going to run it into a Macintosh amplifier. You're kind of not using the, the 2270 for what you paid for. You know, the, the biggest expense inside of the 2270, what you're paying for is that 70 watts per channel. And by doing this type of a configuration with it, I think a lot of people would say you're, you know, you're wasting that amplifier. But again, to each your own, who gives it? Do what you like. There's nothing wrong with doing this. And if that's the way you want to enjoy your stereo, you should enjoy it the way you want it. Don't let anybody tell you not to do something like that. There's nothing wrong with it. Can't thank you enough for all your support out there. Skylabsaudio.com forward slash shop. We've got great t-shirts, hats. We're constantly adding new records to our inventory. So definitely head over there. And definitely don't forget to hit that subscribe button down below. You can always unclick it later. Stay tuned. We've got some